Good. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Houston Beekeepers August meeting. Hello. Yeah. Great. And uh, I hope you guys are all managing to stay cool working your bees. I think uh, working the bees after about 10 o'clock in the morning or maybe stretch till 11 is about as late as you can be out there. I mean, I, I did mine the other day from nine till 10. And I thought I was going to die from the heat. So, you know, uh, just be safe when you're doing it. Um, okay, so important dates coming up. Um, we have September 9th is the Brazos Valley Beekeeper Association. I think that's in, is that College Station they do theirs? Brian in Brian, very close to College Station. And that's an all day event, which is great. You can get eight hours worth of uh, beekeeping education there. Um, and then there's the, that's uh, September 9th. Then I think November 1 is the uh, Texas Beekeepers annual meeting that's in Temple. In Temple. Another, that's a three day thing. So there's all sorts of stuff going on there. Um, okay. So turn over to Mike, VP, introduce the speaker. Uh, Mike, if y'all don't know me, I'm Mike Simmons. I'm the vice president. So I handle the speakers. So I, I set those up throughout the year. So if you have ideas for speakers, just let me know. Uh, we're coming up here on the end of the year pretty quick. And uh, we'll have to come up with new speakers for next year. Um, real quick, I wanted to go through uh, the legislative update. Um, so they passed a new bill this year with the Texas uh, legislation. It's HB 4538. If you're a Texas Beekeeper Association, the state association, you'll have this in your email also. Um, these don't take effect. These take effect on September 1st. So they're not in effect yet. Um, the apiary registration application they used to do that used to be free is now $35. Um, the important part of that too, is if you've already registered an apiary, the, the registration will be null and void on September 1st. So if you want to keep, keep that, you'll have to re-register it. It's not required. Yeah. State law does not, uh, most people register apiaries for, uh, agricultural exemption purposes. Um, you can also some counties that it's it's every different county county's different, but some counties actually look at the registration for uh, mosquito spraying and stuff, and they'll notify beekeepers. Like when they do uh, chamber, like I live in Chambers County, they don't do it. They just spray my bees. They don't care. But like the the after hurricanes and stuff, the ones what they do with the the planes, the C one thirties, those are very bad for bees. The the type of insecticide they spray. So you may want to register. Um, the interstate application uh, that was repealed, so or I'm sorry, intrastate application. So they used to charge a $35 fee, if, and you'd get a permit if you wanted to move bees between counties. Do you no longer need that? Um, if you're doing removals, they you, it says you're still required to pay the $35 fee, but it's a different form from the removal transportation form they used to have. Um, the import export application, it used to be $100 eat for each one. So if you wanted to import bees from out of state, you had to get a $100 permit. And then if you want to export them, you had to get a $100 permit. So they combine those and it's uh, $75 now. No, I'm sorry, $250. My bad. The, the uh, apiary inspection. So if you want to have one of the state inspectors come out and inspect your apiary, uh, it used to be 75, now it's 100. Inflation. Um, if you want a, the equipment brands register, so if you wanted to get a, a equipment number to brand your equipment with, instead of having to spray paint your name and address and stuff on there, uh, it, that didn't change, so it's still $10. Uh, queen breeder inspection is $300. There's no change to that. The, uh, the old law used to have, for apiary, it had a definition of six or more hives. That was struck now. So if you have one hive, it, it qualifies as an apiary. Um, they also changed beekeeper to to any person who owns, leases, possesses, controls, or manages one or more colonies of bees for any personal or commercial use. Uh, in situations involving ag valuation exemption, the beekeeper and or landowner can decide who should register. So that, that was actually a good change to the to the law to to encourage more agricultural exemptions. Um, and that's it for legislative updates. If you don't like it, don't tell me, tell your, tell your representatives, state representatives. 
Um, so tonight's speaker is Nicole. She's going to cover uh, mentorship and, and hands-on beekeeping. All right, are we good? Yep. All right, and I should stand where? Right. Good. I'm good. Okay, great. I might move around a bit, but we'll see. Can everyone see? Can you see? Yes, yes. All right, hi, welcome. So glad you guys can make it to the Bee Club meeting. Um, my name is Nicole Bergers. I am a professional mentor. I have been um, mentoring through B2B Honey Collective since 2016. Um, and I have installed hundreds and hundreds of beehives in backyards, on balconies, rooftops all throughout the city. Um, and I have successfully graduated um, dozens and dozens of beekeepers, um, definitely have had some success, some failures, some pitfalls. So these are gonna be kind of all of my lessons that I've learned over the years and um, just some storytelling and some, some, Things you should know um, for new beekeepers, either pre-beekeeping, just starting, have been beekeeping for a while, or even established beekeepers, this content is for everybody that is interested in bees. So it is it is very good. Um, before I was a beekeeper, I was a full-time marketer. Um, that's me at Google, very excited to be in the honeycomb. And then I transitioned my life into full-time beekeeping um, I started beekeeping only in 2014 um, and uh, quickly decided that it's what I wanted to do all day, every day. So, and that's what I do now. Um, and happy to answer questions about that, but this isn't going to be a sales pitch for B2B because I'm currently not taking on any mentees, um, but I'm going to definitely be um, giving you some resources like the Bee Club um, where you can find mentorship. So... <laughs> it did not work. <laughs> All right. So um, before we get into why mentorship matters, I kind of want to get into a timeline of what it's like to become a beekeeper and what it's uh, phases that you may or may not go through uh, as beekeeping. Um, so the timeline here I have make the decision to become a beekeeper. Now, maybe this decision was made for you. <laughs> maybe the bees came to you. Maybe it's something you wanted for a long time, and then you finally decide to take the leap. Um, but some process, uh, usually you make this decision to become a beekeeper. You start getting prepared, hopefully, to become a beekeeper. <laughs> Your excitement is building. This is a very um, romantic time in, in your beekeeping journey. Um, you have very um, a vision of what beekeeping is going to be like. Um, it's probably not going to match what the reality of beekeeping is. Um, then you get your bees, which is a very exciting day, but you quickly become overwhelmed. You are absorbing all this information and it's, it's a little extreme. <laughs> um, and you start beekeeping, but you really don't really know what you're looking at when you're opening the beehive and you're very overwhelmed. Uh, I definitely went through that for probably a year. <laughs> opening up my beehive and being like, oh gosh, what is this? Is this good? Is this bad? I'm not sure. Um, you may have a setback. Maybe you lose your bees. Maybe um, you get hurt. Safety concern. Something happens. The bees will humble you in one way or another eventually. It may not happen in this exact timeline or it may go back and forth. <laughs> um, but you'll have some sort of setback and Maybe decide it is time for you to get out of beekeeping. Maybe it's time for you to quit. Um, you will doubt uh, yourself and uh, your decisions, and you'll have a lot of shame, especially if you lost your bees for some reason or another. Um, that will set in. And at that point, a lot of people will quit. Um, if you continue to stick with it, which I hope you do, um, you may start to have a breakthrough. Some epiphanies will happen. You'll maybe start to understand what this beekeeping is. Um, 
sometimes that accelerates and you become a little overconfident. That's where I was when I decided to start a business beekeeping. <laughs> I was at the, I think I know it all kind of uh, point. Um, about second year beekeeper, you'll get, you'll get uh, a little overconfident. Um, but then you'll go back to being humbled by the bees. And uh, it's kind of a, a, a circuit that you'll go through. Um, but once you get it and start sticking with it and enduring, becoming resilient, you will continue to learn and evolve. And you basically are in that process for forever. Um, and that is what beekeeping is so magical. And that's, that's what you want. You have a question? Currently, I am in year nine. Um, but uh, my learning curve is a little bit different than most people because I'm beekeeping every day, every single day. I'm not doing it once or twice a month. Um, so I quickly, uh, had like a hockey stick learning curve, <laughs> um, very quickly learn what not to do. Um, but, uh, I feel like most people don't really feel like they got beekeeping for real, for real until about year 10. So if you're not past year 10 and you're still like swimming in the sea of uncertainty, that is normal. <laughs> very, very normal. Um, I see a lot of people get, especially, I know um, you go to B school and you start learning about things that you're not doing. And all of a sudden you feel like, why am I beekeeping? Um, it's a very hard uh, pill to swallow and you get a lot of um, imposter syndrome with beekeeping. and. Um, I, I, I welcome beekeepers to try to be more open and vulnerable and accept that you will have these losses and these failures. It's a really big part of beekeeping is learning how to deal with the failures and then being able to move on. Um, and it's not something they teach you at bee school, <laughs> but it's something that's very, very important. Um, so... I put little uh, bees at every part of these stages. Having a mentor right after you make the decision, right before you get bees, as you're preparing, as you have no idea what you're doing, having a mentor at, at each of these stages will help you become a better beekeeper and uh, will be vital to your success as a beekeeper. So considering um, having a mentor or even being a mentor, um, you learn a lot and uh, your chances of success are much higher. So why mentorship matters? I have a, a bulleted list. And I wanna make sure I got all of my, my notes for this. So number one, hands-on experience, obviously. Um, having a mentor, being hands-on with the bees is the best way to learn. Um, we all learn a little bit differently. Some people prefer YouTube, some people prefer books, podcasts, what have you. All of that is great, um, but it's not the same of being with the bees in different types of hives at different stages. So you have your own hives and your own, uh, your own process, but if you are allowed to go into other people's hives with your mentor, that's an even better situation. The more hives you're into, the more you'll learn, the more things you'll see in different experiences that you'll have. So hands-on experience, um, to observe these techniques in action, to learn the nuances of bee behavior, um, all of that, all the different phases of beekeeping, it's, it's super important. Um, so local knowledge, why the bee club is an awesome community um, is because beekeeping above anything else is local. And it is local to a, very specific degree. What's happening inside of the city and outside of the city is going to be different. What's happening here versus in Austin versus in Corpus Christi, completely different. So being as local as possible, being a member of your bee club, um, all very important. Um, they, the climate, the local flora, the, the challenges of the region, weather, hurricanes, all of that, it's going to be super important. Um, to help you make decisions. And your mentor has this local knowledge, that they should. Um, beekeeping become, has its own set of challenges and problems and problem solving is a huge part of beekeeping. 
and having someone that you can bounce questions off of and troubleshoot um, issues with is going to help you solve some of these problems. They may be able to give you the pros and cons of a certain approach. Um, so problem solving is a big reason why I like, per I, I'm a beekeeper. I really like to solve problems and kind of do detective work and figure out what's the best course of action here. Um, seasonal guidance, um, beekeeping is a cycle. It goes in seasons. And when we do our initial checks of the year versus when our mites peak versus when our honey flow is versus when uh, you know, honey production ends, all of that is the seasonal cycles. And it's really important to understand those and to um, have someone who has gone through a season or two or three or four that understands kind of like the long-term cycles of beekeeping. It's really easy to think of beekeeping as, you know, spring, fall, winter, but it's really more of a seasonal cycle. Um, safety. Beekeeping alone, it's nice, it's peaceful, but it is unsafe. Um, having someone there just in case is really important. Always beekeep when you go out beekeeping, tell someone where you're going <laughs> if you're going alone. Um, but having a mentor there is having a bit of a security blanket in case something goes wrong. Um, there are, of course, stings, um, but you know, beyond that, having um, you know, an allergic reaction or getting dizzy in your suit because it's 110 degrees outside or um, even um, starting a fire, which I have done, um, you know, having someone there to help you haul water to the fire and put it out. Um, very important to have someone with you. Um, you can develop an allergic reaction to um, bee venom at any time even if you've been beekeeping for a decade. Um, so it's, it's really important that you, you know, know where you are and know who's, there's someone attacking you. <laughs> They're like, don't talk crap about me. <laughs> um, insects, I'm the bug lady, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, safety, very important. Um, just as important networking, um, your mentor is going to have mentors. They're going to have a community. They're going to know people in the beat club. They're going to know other beekeepers that they turn to when they need assistance. Um, and they're gonna open you up to an entire world of, of beekeepers. So having a mentor is kind of a, a doorway into meeting uh, other people that can help you. Uh, let's see, building confidence. Um, you know, learning a new skill is intimidating and you're not gonna be completely uh, assured of yourself getting into the hives and having someone there um, to help you get a solid foundation of skills and of knowledge is really important for you to build up the confidence to be able to do it on your own. Um, so that is um, a great path to building confidence. And then um, your long-term success. A lot of new beekeepers do not think about what it's going to be like five years in the future, continuing beekeeping. Um, having a mentor is, is really essential to your long-term success. Um, it can enhance your learning process, increase your chances of becoming a skilled beekeeper. Um, you know, there are, of course, local bee clubs, online forums. There are um, personal connections. There are many avenues in which to find a mentor. Um, and we're gonna talk about those resources later in the, um, the program. But um, I ask people this all the time, are you really ready to become a beekeeper? So when you're like having someone approach you as a mentor um, saying, hey, I am interested in, I'm sure everyone has a friend who's interested in becoming a beekeeper. Um, this is something that they're excited about. They're, they're kind of living vicariously through your journey. And they're, they are like, hey, I see that you're beekeeping. I also want to learn. Um, are they really ready to become a beekeeper? <laughs> um, a lot of people have this vision of what beekeeping is like. 
and it doesn't always align with what the reality is. So there is a romantic vision of beekeeping and a practical side of beekeeping. And you have to, in your beekeeping journey, you have to have a little bit of both. If it's completely practical, you won't get any enjoyment out of it. You won't feel the rush of opening a hive, smell the honey, hear the buzz. It, it is a very romantic activity. Um, and it's something, you know, a reason why it's really hard to quit sometimes. <laughs> um, even though you think about quitting every once in a while, you know, the bees will draw you back in. It's this, this very romantic vision. Um, but practically, you have to learn how to take care of these insects, to learn about these insects. Um, you're going to sweat. You're going to get stung. You're going to cut yourself. Things are going to happen, and it's going to be really hard and really difficult to continue the practice of, of, of beekeeping. So if someone just thinks it sounds like a cool hobby, that's great. But you really need to make sure they know both sides of the coin before they get started. Um, and I always ask them what their long-term goals are. Um, do they plan on living in the same spot? Do they plan on maybe they're young and they're gonna get married and have kids or, or, or you know, they have a life plan. Um, they're thinking about relocating. Maybe not the great time to start beekeeping. If you have all these hurdles in your life that you haven't completed yet and you're not sure where you're going to be in the next five years plus, then um, not, not a good thing. Um, if people are pretty stay put, have, have their, their stuff together and they're ready to beekeep, there's also like things like, oh, I wanna build a pool one day or I'm gonna replace this fence eventually and, and I'm gonna build a shed over here. And, and knowing all these things about their yard and what it's going to entail is also really super important because that can quickly have an effect on your beekeeping journey. Um, the best person to become a men mentee has already started learning. Maybe they've attended some bee club meetings. Maybe they've attended a class. Maybe they've been reading books and they've, they're, they're not coming in completely green. Um, and if they haven't, it's a good time to get them started on, hey, you need to attend a class before I can start helping you. Or, hey, you need to at least have this solid like foundation of education before we get started. Because um, some people suddenly have bees, maybe they lucked into them or were inherited or they had bees that were in their yard and now they're keeping them um, and they need help now, understood. Um, you can still help these people, <laughs> but you really want them to get them started on having a good solid foundation of education. Um, do they have the time for beekeeping? It takes a lot of time, a lot of learning. Um, do they have the funds for beekeeping? It's, you know, it can obviously be a money pit if you want it to be, <laughs> um, or even if you don't. Uh, and then, you know, do they have the space? Um, whether that's even on a rooftop or a balcony, that's fine, but they have to have something in mind already. Um, and then the most important quality in a mentee is, are they resilient? Do they have the stick to itness, the endurance to continue beekeeping? Um, you know, I'm, it's my job, it's my career. I think about quitting probably once a week. It's common. <laughs> Um, you know, you've gotten stung in the face or you're hauling a 50 pound bag of sugar or you're sweating at 11 p.m. At, at, uh, on a day when the humidity is at 100 percent. Like you're like, what am I doing to myself? Um, moving bees at night, waking up really early in the morning, you know, all of these things, um, you know, it does take a type of personality that will endure <laughs> beekeeping. Um, and it's not for everybody. You ask someone if they're resilient or if they're a, a learner or they're curious um, about, about life. Of course, everyone's going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a smart, curious. I stick to things. Um, it's hard to self-evaluate <laughs> when it comes to these types of uh, qualities. But um, asking the right questions, getting to the root of all of this stuff with the person is, is really essential. 
um, are you ready to be a mentor? You may be ready to be a mentor and not know it. Um, teaching others is one of the best ways to learn how to be key, but you need to be ready. Um, the, the right type of mentor is a good teacher. They're a good communicator. They have um, been successful. They have overwintered bees year after year. They don't buy their bees every year. If you have a mentor that buys their bees every year, maybe not a good mentor. Um, uh, they are knowledgeable about many aspects of beekeeping, not just commercial beekeeping, not just hobby beekeeping, but they, they've, they've gone to different types of classes. They understand the long-term cycles, um, and they have the time. A lot of people don't, but if they're already volunteering, <laughs> maybe they are volunteering on the board of the bee club. <laughs> um, Maybe they have been going to schools and demonstrating, going to churches and giving presentations. Um, this is like a, a classroom, you know. Um, if they're already doing these types of things, they may be a good candidate for a mentor. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really um, kind of hard to, to find both a good mentor and a good mentee. It's not as easy as just saying, I need help or I can help you. It's, it's really creating um, a, a good relationship between the two parties. So the right student, they, they ask why. They, they ask a lot of questions. They're doing their own research. They're reading articles. They're saying, hey, have you heard about this? What does this mean in regards to my beekeeping? Um, they've already gone to an introductory class. They've already gone to bee school. They've already have this, this layer of foundation, they already have a plan on how they're going to continue to learn once they get bees or once they have already gotten bees. <laughs> um, and they don't use the mentor as a crutch. They are independently learning. They're not just saying, hey, I need the mentor. And without the mentor, I can't be a beekeeper. Um, I find that a lot. Um, in my line of work that people are dependent on me um, to a certain degree. And it's, it's hard to, to wean them from, from having someone there all the time. Um, the right mentor explains. They just don't say, I'm gonna move these frames over in, and create um, space in your hive. They explain that they are moving the frames over. They're not just doing it and not explaining what's going on. Um, they are pretty agnostic when it comes to different beekeeping philosophies. Um, they're open-minded, say, okay, you don't have to do the way the, this process the way I do it. If you want to do it in a different method, that should be okay. They need to be open-minded that they're not creating a mini-me. It's going to be their own, the mentee's own personal philosophy, and they are just a part of that. Um, so they have to be really open to that idea, which is hard for a lot of people. Um, providing um, alternatives, options, pros and cons. Um, and then the mentor themselves continuously evolving. They should be on an educational plan. They should be learning. They should be going to these B schools as well and, and taking the upper level classes. They should also, um, you know, understand the the new laws and the new techniques, as well as the old laws and old techniques. They should understand how both of them um, are, are changing and evolving and how beekeeping is constantly changing. Um, so the right mentor is not stuck in their, in their own ways. So mentorship's not for everybody. Um, not everyone should be a mentor and not everyone needs to be a mentor. So um, they, not everyone's a good teacher. There are a lot of bad mentors out there. I, um, I was uh, in a situation where I needed help and some guy uh, said that he would help me and he started assisting me and I learned very quickly that we had the same level of experience. And I think he just, you know, he wanted to help, but it wasn't the, it was a little like mansplaining. <laughs> Um, uh, good mentors are very rare. Um, so if you are having someone help you and you're not 
feeling that it's actually helping, it's okay. You can, you know, find someone else. Um, a lot of mentors just come in and do the work and don't explain anything. Um, that would be a bad mentor. Um, and <laughs> what I struggle with, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of um, understanding um, to be a mentor. Um, sometimes, especially, you know, in the heat, or uh, you know, after a long day of beekeeping, you're not the most patient person. Um, it's, it is a, a very special um, person that can, can be a mentor. Um, but not everyone needs a mentor. P plenty of people have been successful beekeepers without a mentor. Um, not everyone's a good student. Um, my, um, some of my worst students are teachers. <laughs> um, and they they know that they're not doing their homework and they're not they're not uh, coming through when they need to, um, you know. And people do learn in different ways. Perhaps having a one on one relationship with someone isn't doesn't work for you. You'd rather learn via YouTube or via the just B school or what have you. Um, and having no mentor is probably better than having a bad mentor. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, Mentorship is not for everyone. I'm not saying that in order to be a successful beekeeper, you need to have a mentor because it's just not true. Um, I do find it's helpful. I think I turned it off, maybe. <laughs> I don't know what button I hit. Uh, what was um, eight? <laughs> yeah, okay, the nine, we're good. I don't know what happened. I might've hit something. It's very possible. I have fat fingers. Um, so we are nine. The most important quality that you need to find within your mentor or your mentee is compatibility. You're going to have probably a two plus year relationship with this person. If you guys don't get along, like what's the point? You guys have to have a friendship also. Um, it's really unpleasant if you do not like your mentor or you do not like your mentee. Um, you're not looking forward to your meetings. You're not looking forward to your beekeeping. It really sours the whole experience. I have had um, many students I was incompatible with. <laughs> um, and it was, uh, I think, a chore for both of us to get together and beekeep. And it definitely hurt the, the long-term success of that beekeeper because we just didn't really like each other. Um, you also wanna be pretty close in proximity um, to, to your mentor or mentee. Um, if your mentor or mentee lives across the, the city and can't get to you or it's a struggle or you have bees in Timbuktu and they're not gonna go out there all the time, um, it's, it's find someone close to you, um, someone in your, your vincidity. vincidity. Um, how frequently are you guys getting together how frequently can you check your bees together? That's a that's a big compatibility issue. Um, different philosophies, different techniques. So if your beekeeper mentor um, says solid bo bottom boards only, and you're like, well, I want to experiment with a screen bottom board, and you guys just can't like see eye to eye, it might be a problem. They might blame any failure you have on the type of equipment you're using or the type of techniques you're you're learning. So you don't have to be 100%, um, you know, the same philosophy or the same techniques as your mentor or mentee, but it's good to have an understanding of, you at least have a like common end goal. You're like, yes, we're both raising bees for pollination, or we, we both are in the honey game, or we, we both, are into top bar hives, whatever it may be. You want to find at least some some connection there, um, and then you also want to know how is this relationship going to end. Is there going to be your first honey harvest as an endpoint or end goal? Is it going to be, you know, a, a certain day? Let's say, you know, two years from today. Um, is it going to be? You need to have some sort of end line because you can't have a mentor forever and they can't help you forever. And at some point you're going to break up. <laughs> um, you still will always have someone to turn to, of course. Um, but 
it may be, there's a point where I say someone graduates and they know it when they're, they're ready. Um, but if they don't want to admit to that, they don't want to have the confidence to say that they can do it on their own, you might have to do that for them. Um, so when it comes to mentorship, there are a lot of questions that you want to, um, to ask. Um, and a big one that I like to say is, what's your tuition? Are you doing the work? Um, are you not just showing up, but you're, you're showing that you are making progress. You are doing your homework. Um, maybe your tuition is literally money. Maybe your tuition is, I'm going to help you build boxes or I'm, you know, there should be a give and a take. Um, yes, mentorship can be a loving service where you, you know, pay it forward, but it's really, it gets really difficult if there isn't a, something in return, whether that's commitment or follow through or an actual like labor or money or something. Um, it, it doesn't seem to always um, be successful without that. Um, you need to ask um, like what's gonna be involved time-wise. Are we coming together once a month? Are we coming together once a quarter, every other week? How often are we going to be meeting? Um, equipment. <laughs> this is a really tricky one um, because you want your mentee to have all the equipment that they need. Um, but there will become come a day where your mentor or your mentee does not have a specific tool or a specific, um, they run out of boxes or <laughs> something happens where you can step in and help. Um, so you need to have a, uh, a general guidance on, okay, you need to have this equipment ready when I come, or you need to at least have your, your basics, your smoker, your boxes, your frames, um, your veil and your suit. If they haven't gotten the basics and they are already asking for help and they're wanting to borrow everything from you, that's a big red flag. Um, they're just gonna continuously borrow things from you. Now there are like more advanced equipment like the extractor, refractometer, or or something that maybe the beginner beekeeper needs that doesn't have yet. Um, and you know, case by case basis, you can definitely lend them, be like, hey, I know you need this. I'd only use this a few times a year. Sure, borrow mine, but eventually you'll need your own, that sort of thing. Um, you also need to define what supplemental knowledge they will be do do going through and doing because mentorship on its own is not enough. They need to be going to the B club meetings. They need to be going to B school. They need to be taking classes, books, period. If they are not putting in the work, they are not, it's not worth putting in that energy or effort because they're not going to be successful. Um, your place or mine. Um, are you going to their beehives or are they coming to your beehives or both? Um, sometimes it's really nice to have a bunch of beekeepers at your beehive and show them how you do things, but they will also need that kind of hands-on hands -on, uh, experience at their hives because they could be having, I've been to hives that have like an upside down bottom board on and they, they don't realize it and it's been months and you know, there's very basic things that you can't describe over the phone. <laughs> um, so having having uh, a definition of wh what it's going to look like and what where you're going to be doing this learning is very important. Um, I, you know, I said I'm I do this for a living. I have um, this how I I I make an income is through mentorship. So I have money involved. Um, what is that going to look like? Um, is it per visit? Is it per month? Is it as needed? Um, you know, that's a that's an important question. Um, and that also goes into how formal is this mentorship? Is this something that we're going to have a contract over? Or is this just friends getting together and beekeeping? Both are great. 
both serve a purpose. It's just, you have to define these things up front. Um, and then of course, defining that end goal, that benchmark, where is this going to end? Define that at the very beginning, because if not, it could be a problem. Um, when you're doing this as a mentor, um, you're gonna wanna start to celebrate the wins um, because it is kind of a hard and uh, strenuous journey. So I always celebrate the installation, their, their B-Day, um, how well they're working. You know, at first you are, um, you can't light the smoker. And then once they finally kind of started successfully have their smoker lit and they can have it lit the whole time, um, that's a win. Um, same thing with the tool work. You know, you see a new beekeeper really struggle with their tools and lifting up frames. And once they get that down, that's another milestone. Um, egg literacy is a huge milestone. Um, I know I could not see eggs uh, for many months when I first started. And then one day I just kind of, it kind of focused in where I see them every time now, but it took me a little while to get my veil and my eyes and my glasses and everything used to being able to see eggs. So the day that someone reliable, reliable <laughs> can really see eggs, <laughs> um, that's, that's always a good day. Um, I even celebrate the first sting that, that makes them an official beekeeper. Um, your first mic check, your first solo beekeeping check on your own. Um, first time you overwinter your bees successfully, your first honey harvest, the first time you split, first time you requeen, all of these things are very big milestones that should be celebrated along the mentorship journey. This is me um, tasting honey, my honey for the first time. And that's the bad mentor I mentioned. <laughs> I hope no one recognizes him. <laughs> um, so maybe mentorship or having a mentor or being a mentor is not for you. There are still other things you can do and things that I continue to do for people was, is consulting. So it's less formal. It's on an as needed basis. Um, it's usually like a more in-depth uh, task, like, having to move a hive, requeen a hive, having to hun har harvest honey. Um, and it, this is really good for when um, your ment mentee graduates and you're like, I'm still on call, call me when you need me, but you're on your own. So um, this, a lot of beekeepers, new beekeepers use this as a service as well. They think, okay, I'm gonna try this on my own as best as I can, but eventually I'm gonna need some sort of help and when I do, I'm gonna give you a call. So consulting is, is what I call it. Um, consulting is, is really a kind of a, another layer of mentorship that is less formal and uh, can be uh, really great. Um, beyond that, shadowing. Also an awesome way to learn about bees and an awesome way to get um, extra hands when you need them. I always say that beekeeping requires at least three three arms. <laughs> and when you're by yourself, you don't have those three arms. So you need you know, a hand for the smoker, a hand for a frame, a hand for a tool. Um, and you just don't have that when you're alone. So having extra hands um, on deck is always a great thing. Um, shadowing just sometimes means someone being there and watching. Sometimes it means, hey, you're gonna hold the smoker smoke smoke my hand while I do this. Um, sometimes it's it's um, more involved. Say, hey, I'm I'm doing a really hard task today. I'm going to be mic checking 20 hives in a row. I'm gonna need someone to uh, you know fill the mic checker or I'm gonna need someone to count mics and document them. And, and having a lot of people on hand is really helpful. Um, B2B has a very healthy shadow program. Um, we have 172 people in our shadow program. I email them my schedule every week and I say, hey, this is where I'm going to be. If you want to join me, you can. Just you know, reply back so I don't have too many people at one place and I can coordinate the directions and everything. Um, so I send out my schedule every week and um, allow people who have never beekeeped before to come and beekeeping. I provide them a suit provide them um, a waiver <laughs> that they must sign. Um, 
that's another legal thing that you may want to decide. Uh, that was with the mentorship questions, contractual legal stuff. Um, but yeah, I do that. I have a waiver and um, here's a suit and you are going to jump right in. Um, I find that it's a great way for people who are still on the fence deciding whether they should become a beekeeper or not to really see if this is something that they want to continue to do. So um, shadowing is great. These are um, my shadow team. Um, probably like a month ago, we were we were at my larger apiary, and we were we had um, somebody taking down a tree right next to a, a really mean hive we were going to open. So we were taking a break, waiting for that to be over. Um, so we were hanging out, and you get to just talk about bees, which is great. Um, so there are a lot of resources. Um, really important is this HBA mentorship program. You guys familiar with this? So the HBA has a mentorship program. They pair you, um, a mentor and a mentee together for a year, I believe. And um, it's it's a great program. Um, B schools, um, we mentioned the Brazos Valley B School on September 9th. In the spring, the Central Texas Beekeepers Association B School is great. The TBA Summer Clinic, always great. You go to the annual meetings, there are introductory courses. Um, I provide them. Other beekeepers have introductory courses. Um, other um, um, bee, bee supply companies have um, introductory courses. Universities have introductory courses. Um, you can go and get a lot of um, bee knowledge. Um, Winding Creek, which is a bee supply company up in Willis, Every Saturday morning, they have um, spit and whittle where you just come. They have free donuts and free kolaches and free coffee, and you can just talk about bees. Great. Um, <laughs> um, Facebook groups are a great way to ask questions or see questions being asked. Um, HBA has a great Facebook group. Um, there's other local Facebook groups. Um, the Texas Friendly Beekeepers, excellent Facebook group for a lot of um, questions. Um, and then there are other beekeepers, professional beekeepers like B2B. Um, they offer either mentorship, management, if you want to be hands off, um, consulting, shadowing, just help when needed. Um, there are a lot of removal help. If you want to learn how to be a removal remover, um, shadowing and apprenticing under a, a removal specialist is a great way to decide if that's for you or not. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of other professional beekeepers in Houston um, that offer these services. So it's it's a whole world of knowledge out there. This is my beekeeping course. It's a two-day course. Um, it's about nine hours of beekeeping, um, including going out to the hives. Um, my next one is September 23rd and 24th. You can find that on my website, b2bhoney.com. Um, and it's it's uh, the first half of the course is about um, the beekeeper, what you need to know, time, money, supplies, education. And the second half is about bees and bee biology and techniques and behavior, all of that. And then we go and we go into the educational apiary and play with bees. And that happens um, in Montrose. I feel like I've been talking forever. Questions about mentorship, um, stories about being a mentor or uh, having a mentee <laughs> or wanting a mentor. Um, who here has a mentor? Gigi does. Who does? Yeah. Okay, great. Who here wants a mentor? <laughs> Good. So, I mean, maybe, you know, we can, it's, it's, I know in my first HBA meeting, I came before I had bees. I knew I needed a mentor and I came in. Bee club looked a little bit different back then. Um, uh, it was, I was the, I think the one of three females, um, definitely the only one with pink hair at the time. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm introverted. I, I wasn't really wanting to raise my hand and be like, who can help me? Um, I just didn't feel right. So I I proceeded without a mentor, even though I know I wanted one. 
Um, I feel like things have changed now, especially in HBA, especially just in general. There are a lot of families, a lot of different types of people getting bees. Um, it's a different world now. And I feel like, yes, it's intimidating to ask and find a mentor um, or more. Maybe you need more than one mentor. You can have three mentors and decide, you know, what's working and what's not. It's like dating. <laughs> um, but, you know, hopefully you're compatible. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, I mean, I don't know, you could fall in love. I don't know. I haven't fallen in love with any of my students. <laughs> but, um, you know, that would be a very neat, cute type of thing. Um, so um, we have questions. Hey, yes. How do you tell people, you know, there's so many opinions of how to treat safe of mind. Sure. Yeah. What kind of advice can you give people? To, how can you sort through all that to figure out what's the best way for you? Yeah. So what I do um, when someone has a mite problem, we do a test and I say, oh, you're over the threshold. Here are all of your options. I go, you know, let's go to the Honey Bee Health Coalition website, look at the IPM pyramid, look at, you know, from synthetic to essential oils to organic acids to um, cultural, uh, physical, all, all of the different layers. And I say, you know, this is, this is what I would do. You do not have to do what I would do. This is what I recommend, but you know, I, it's important for you to start looking at these videos and making this assessment yourself. Um, here, is, here is all the information that you need to look through. And then together we can come up with a strategy. Um, and it may, if they are, you know, say a natural beekeeper and they just want to do a brood break or, or something like that, then I say, okay, we, we will do this. Um, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> a lot of times they just want to say, oh, this is too much information. I can't make this decision. It's like decision fatigue. Um, you know, I want you to make this decision for me. And I say, I can give you my recommendation, but like you need to do the work on your own to d understand what we're doing together. That's what I do. And I, I have a form letter saying, I'm sorry, you have mites. Like I have this like letter where I have, um, you need to read this document first, then go to this website, watch these videos. Here's a, uh, you know, there's a tool on the Honey Bee Health Coalition website that's like allows you to put in whether you have honey supers on, how hot it is, assessment tool, like what are your options? Um, I, I give them options that are not on the Honey Bee Health Coalition website. Things that I, I, I do thermal treatments, which aren't on the, the uh, Honey Bee Health Coalition website. And I'm like, we have this as an option, you know? Um, so I, I kind of, and I tell them what's on the, what's on the um, horizon. Like they're working on lithium chloride. They're working on mushrooms. They're working on all these different things for, for mites as well. So, you know, stay tuned. Um, you know, this isn't the end all be all. And what we do today may not be what we do next time this happens. Um, so there's, there's that sort of, it's, it's a, it's a, it's another milestone. <laughs> Maybe not celebratory. But it's definitely something that will eventually happen to everybody. So we're going to cross that bridge and uh, go cross it together. Good question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I am <laughs> I am completely agnostic when it comes to screen or solid. I personally run screen bottom boards with a west trap underneath. Um, but if someone wants has a solid, they come to me with a solid bottom board or whatever, I don't worry about it. I just teach them, you know, bring, give them water. Yeah. Are they happier? I don't think anyone's happy right now. <laughs> I had a couple of, my, my happiest hive is actually a rooftop beehive on the rooftop of this, the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. That is my happiest beehive. Baking. And they are the chillest. I don't know. I don't know. I can't explain it. 
Uh, I wish I was. I mean, that sounds expensive, honestly. I tell people, people are like, why can't we use this? I was like, no. it sounds way expensive. <laughs> but yeah, they're super chill. Um, so yeah, I, I can't, I say all the bees right now are kind of grumpy, honestly. Um, which makes working so pleasant. <laughs> yeah, there it, it's everyone's grumpy. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Do you have other assistants to help? I have a team. Um, yeah, it, it was just me for the first five years, six years. Um, and I finally could afford to pay someone else. <laughs> um, I got, uh, once I got it, into the um, farmer's markets and had um, the honey was actually moving, I had an, a good honey supply. Um, I could afford to have more people on my team. Um, so I currently have um, one full-time beekeeper with me. Um, and then I have um, kind of a like a part-time extractor and can beekeep if needed type of person. Um, I'm going on vacation tomorrow. And um, my, my lead beekeeper, he's going to be handling... All, everything for me while I'm gone. So I can do that now, but I couldn't do that for years. It was just me. How many, um, about, but I, I have a radius. So I do, I, if, when I first started, I said yes to everybody. And I would drive, I drove to Cleveland. I would drive to Katy. I, you know, I drive to um, Seabrook all over the place. I now have a radius. I only do it inside the tollway, the Sam Houston tollway. It's still pretty far, but um, I pair up all the different locations. So if I'm visiting one, I'll visit the other. And I have like little routes I'll do. Um, so depending on the routes um, and the time of year, um, it can be anywhere from four to five calls a day to like right now it's a little bit lighter. I'm doing about two to three calls a day. And it depends on like, how many people I have. Um, last summer, I had 37 clients, thir locations. Um, and it was a lot. And my team quit. <laughs> and it was just me doing it all for a minute. But I ended up getting some help, and it was great. But yeah, if you saw me last summer, I was not, not a great person. <laughs> um, but yeah, good question. Um, and then you have um, uh, unforeseen things. Someone will call me with an emergency or someone will call with um, like out of the blue saying, hey, um, you helped me four years ago. Uh, my hive's really hot right now. I need to requeen it. Can you help me? You know, that sort of thing. And you're like spur of the moment type of spontaneous <laughs> checking of hives. There's always some sort of bee emergency. Um, to the point where I don't answer my phone and you have to text me because <laughs> I, I get a lot of swarm calls. So, yeah. Yes. Someone online asked, what is, what's your craziest bee emergency? Ooh. Oh, my gosh. Um, my craziest bee emergency. Let's see. I have so many. <laughs> um, I mean, I've had. I, I, I'll say no a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like this, this isn't a job for me. Um, but I will, um, I have gone, let's see, I should have these just in my pocket. Um, I have gone, um, having to, I have to close up so many hives because they are replacing, um, a fence or a building or something the next day. And all of a sudden you have to move a whole bunch of beehives. I'd say maybe like Hurricane Harvey. That was probably the craziest time. Um, I had food poisoning that week. Um, so I couldn't prepare a lot of my hives because I was just like, I couldn't leave the bathroom. Um, so I did what I could. I, I um, my rooftop hives, I ratchet strapped them. I put weight on them because I would thought, you know, it was they were going to blow away. I didn't worry too much about my flooding. Um, so I, I did, you know, incur a lot of losses. Um, and then the aftermath with the spraying, um, that was that was probably the craziest two days where we were going around all the hives and putting um, sheets 
over all the hives to, to protect them from the aerial spraying. Um, it was a, a difficult time. Just like bed sheets. Yeah, like damp bed sheets. Yeah. It was really, yeah, it was really intense after Hurricane Harvey. Yeah. Yeah. It right there's um something you can do um in harris county um you can get on a no spray list um so yeah there are things you can do yeah. Yeah, they do. Um, and so Joe, our treasurer, um, not this Joe, the other Joe, um, she's not here tonight, but she was in, the, she's in the collective. She's a graduated member of the collective and she got on the no spray list for Bel Air because she lives around the corner here. Um, and sh her house is on two different lots. And she had four hives and the hive that was right in the corner of her yard got poisoned. Um, we saved it. She caught it right away. And we went in and, and um, cleaned it all out. And the bees ended up surviving. And then it happened again. And I was like, I think your bees are getting sprayed. She's like, I'm on the no spray list. It's fine. But since her house was on two different lots, they only, they only did the like far side of her house. And then right behind her house, there's a stop sign. The guy would just sit there at the stop sign. And that's how her bees started getting sprayed. Um, so she figured it out and contacted them and they know now not to spray anywhere around that corner. Um, and she's had success since then. So, yeah. What have you done to try to get people to get organizations, cities to plant pollinators? For example, mm -hmm. in the September, October issue of Texas Garden, they published my letter about wild gardening for pollinators. Mm -hmm. And you and doing this business, do you do anything to try to get people to contact their local cities, governments, or whatever to do something to plant pollinators or be more breed friendly? Yeah, I mean, um, it all depends on the person. All right. Some people are more civically active than others. Um, but if that is in their brand, in their personality. Um, yeah, I know, for example, Joe, um, I'll use her as an example again. She, um, she, because of her insistence with the mosquito spraying, they ended up having her present um, at the, I don't know what it was, the Bel Air, like, beet plant, uh, wildflower festival, something like that. And uh, HBA ended up having a, a booth there, I believe. And yeah, it was all because of Joe's persistence. Um, they, I met the uh, public works guy, um, his name was Bo, and he, he came and he checked the hives with us, like just to see what it was like. Um, so Bel Air could be more bee friendly and understand what Joe was doing. Um, you know, I, I definitely want people to be advocates um, as well as stewards for their bees. Um, can I make everyone do that? No. Um, but if that's something that's in their wheelhouse and um, if there is, um, for example, it's a great example, Westview, um, they have B ordinance. And when that happened, um, I was contacted um, by a good Samaritan to tell me to show up at city hall that night. And I did to plead my case. And then I ended up um, bringing other members, of uh, other beekeepers from HBA and from the collective. And we got the word out. A bunch of beekeepers showed up at the Westview meeting at City Hall and they decided to pause the vote until they could get more information because they didn't realize that there was a whole population of beekeepers. They ended up passing a stupid ordinance anyway. Um, 
but they um, several city council members uh, ran on the I'm going to repeal that ordinance um, after it was found not to be successful and yeah I guess the thing I was looking at is people probably don't realize that they can do something you know in other words, what 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 I'm kind of saying is we as beekeeper associations need to be telling our members look you can have an impact but you gotta get off your butt and quit watching TV and mm -hmm. write a letter or do whatever yeah and make it happen because I don't think you know, our city government said. Uh, I, I mean, they paid attention in Westview, uh, which was really great. Um, they they weren't prepared for the amount. I mean, yeah, well, the news showed up. Like it oh, was, yeah. uh, it was, it was a big deal. Um, it was pretty intense, and I was not prepared to speak in front of all those people, but I did it. <laughs> Oh yeah, there are people, I mean, the Native Plant Society um, is really involved. I mean, there are other groups also involved and, in, you know, Master Gardeners, all of that, all trying to work together towards that. The TBA has a lobbyist now, which is why we had all this change in the legislature. Um, but, you know, what they are working on is predicated at the annual meetings. So attending those annual meetings and having a voice there is pretty important. Temple, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's more and more of the kind of impact of the things we have to people that Yes. Okay. So the question is about aggressive bees. Um, I have a um, one strike policy. Um, and it's, bees might be having a bad day. Like they may have, you may have grumpy bees, but if I go twice and you still have really aggressive bees, we, we, we requeen those. I do not allow any feral queens in the collective. I do not let my queens ferally mate. I replace them with known genetics. What, yeah. What you A bee weaver queens. <laughs> Bee weaver, what, what, where, how, where am I getting queens? I buy queens from bee weaver, they're expensive, um, <laughs> but I like them. <laughs> um, but you know, you can find your own. I'm not, this is not a commercial for bee weaver by any means. Um, you can find your own, um, you know, supplier um, that you're comfortable with. Yeah. There is none. No. Oh, no, six hives oh, then. Yeah, I wouldn't let someone have more than six hives. Six hives. Joe tried to get six hives, and I was like, too many, Joe, too many. It had to do, um, I think it's still active, um, but it's not being enforced because I'm definitely bringing the law. Um, hello, West U. Um, <laughs> um, it has to do with um, property lines and how far away you are location i think it's like 100 feet from a property line which the postage stamp uh yards yeah exactly so it's something like that and you have to have a barrier of like six feet in front of the hive stuff they try to copy the austin ordinance after speaking with um tara don chapman of two hives honey she came in um to speak to the west U, and i was like oh tara i wish you and i spoke beforehand because west U does not have yards like you know, random yards in Austin are. So it was kind of subversive. There, no, Houston doesn't have any. Yes. It's the gold standard for mosquitoes, but when you read the MSDS, it said you should only spray the rural areas that are wet. And so it got down to the Yeah. So, yeah, so, so some of those, the, the farmers were spraying last for two years. Yeah. Well, this had to happen like 23 days, and we're spraying every week, so we had to drill down. One day they sprayed, I don't know how much I draw, thousands of dead bees, double dose of it. So That's it was, terrible. But it did double. 
Yeah, it's difficult. Um, but I, I find, I mean, having city bees, I probably have one poisoning a year so with all that has. Yeah, it's not that common. You have a permit to, to a permit to do removals or I don't know. <laughs> I say that a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's four four apiary inspectors. That's why the the price rose because they're traveling all over the state, and there's only four of them. But I understand. Um, but yeah, um, the um, Texas um, there's a Texas Bee Removal um, Association, and they they are on top of a lot of the laws. Um, so how many hives do I have personally? Not that many, um, probably about 25, two locations. I do sell, I will, uh, the way the, the collective works is I get a percentage of the honey harvest. Um, so I have an in also for their success. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get a percentage of their harvest um, and I sell that by neighborhood. So I have currently 28 neighborhoods for sale, something like that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um. to the, the per, parasitic mite virus. They've, they've 32 viruses. Yeah, but Varroa carries 32 different viruses or something like that. There's a lot of marketing from bee supply companies that, that um, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, the only place inside of the city is a Wabash, which is really expensive, and I don't typically recommend them. Um, there's a new place that I think is opening. Um, one of my competitors um, is opening a bee supply store um, in Oak Forest area. Um, his name, uh, the company name is Soldiers of Wax. Um, and there, but he's only doing 10 frame, um, equipment from what I can tell. I do not No. You can go to Dayton, you can go to Meadville, you can go to Navasota, you can go to Willis. Uh, they're all, they're all a drive. Yeah. A lot of them have free shipping. Yeah, but there are a lot of different different things. But online is where I get a lot of my supplies. I, it, only in emergencies will I go locally. Like I need, uh, I really like a Magnolia bee supply actually is one of my favorites because they're open late. Um, they don't have the same hours as a lot of the bee supply stores will be closing like at four or five in the afternoon and I have I'm working. So um uh, Magnolia Bee Supply, which this is a commercial for, um, uh, Andy is really great. And he, um, he's open to like nine at night. And so I'll go up there, have dinner, <laughs> you know, wait for traffic, <laughs> whatever. And, uh, and, uh, get supplies from Magnolia Bee Supply. I like that, that place a lot. Um, but it all depends on my needs and how quickly I need it. I usually order it online if I can but now I have like a pretty good library of equipment. Every once in a while I'll run out of something. <laughs> um, all right, uh, one more. All right, this is how you can contact me. You can contact me anytime. 
Um, I have a phone number. You can text me. You call me. I probably won't answer it. Um, email address, my website. I have um, free text support anytime. <laughs> this will be on our YouTube channel. Yeah. So feel free to contact me if you need help and you need an extra hand. Um, you have a question. You have to see something weird in your hive. I'm, I am here to be a tool in your toolbox on your beekeeping journey, whatever that means to you. Um, so. All right. All right. Thank Great you job. so much for letting me talk. And if you have, um, you want cards, I have them too. Oh, microphone. microphone. Yeah. I was like, I'll get my what? All right. All right. Great. Fantastic. You got it. But I was wearing it. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Thank okay. You. Just real quick, everybody. <clears throat> um, okay. So September 9th is Brazos Beekeepers. November 1 is Texas Beekeepers. Those are, you know, the, the November 1 is a, like a three-day event. The September 9th is an all-day event. So you can... Learn about, I'm staying in the wrong place, aren't I, Kyle? I see that now. Thank you. And uh, uh, so that's great. That's a lot of beekeeping knowledge there. Our mentor, the first one is in uh, uh, Bryan, Texas, on September 9th, then Temple on November 1st. Um, that's the third. No, Bryan's a one day. That's a one day. And then um, our mentor program that uh, Nicole was talking about, it basically runs um, from uh, Thanksgiving uh, or, you know, it sort of starts off in, in November and runs through the next November. So it's November to November. So if you want to sign up for the, be it to be mentored. And I saw a few hands go up that wanted to get mentors, then just go online. We have a little form you fill out and then that generates a spreadsheet. So then we can match you up with people who can live kind of in your neighborhood to help you with your beats. Okay. So it's pretty easy to do. And then we go through at these meetings. At, in fact, after this meeting, we'll be over here to talk to any of you guys who are being mentored now or have questions, and we can answer questions today after the meeting. And then I think uh, our next meeting is third Tuesday in September, which is – what date is that? I forgot. The September 19th. And that meeting is important because that's the meeting where we need to do our nominations for officers, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. We really need badly a treasurer right now. It'd be great if somebody wants to be president. Awesome. Be awesome. Vice president, vice president. Yeah, particularly president. Timed out? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I'll make you treasurer. It'd be great. Okay, so now... Uh, Mike, I'll let you do the uh, the drawings. Yeah, we can do both. Yeah. All right. Uh, Door prizes. Tim, I'm gonna turn this one off. Ron Collins. 